Well, thank you very much, and it's a joy to be here with you all. Uh, there's a few things I'd like to state. The very first message was by Dr. Nicholas, in which he stole much of what I was to speak on. <laughs> then last hour, with Dr. Thomas Ice, he took the rest of it. <laughs> but if you'd like to see it presented in a different way, I'll be at the little country church tonight, and uh, I'm going to preach the same message tomorrow also on hope and the promised land. It's time to wake up. Several of you have already asked me about what uh, Thomas Ice spoke about, but you asked me before he ever spoke. And you said, is the opposition to the support of Israel getting worse? The answer is yes. They have put out videos that are absolutely, for instance, Dr. Paul Wilkinson, who was on the screen with uh, Dr. Um, Isis' presentation, has been attacked without mercy. Uh, he is the one that did a doctoral dissertation on John Nelson Darby of the Plymouth Brethren. And the opposition is claiming that a woman named Margaret MacDonald from Scotland is the one that came up with the pre-trib a viewpoint. I never knew Margaret MacDonald. I only knew the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. And I came to a firm conviction, conviction. And by the way, no one in this conference yet has mentioned what I believe is the ultimate answer on the pre-trib issue. It cannot be denied. I have debated this by many people, and they can't deny it. So what is it? Well, in order to really know that, you'd have to buy one of my books. <laughs> well, let me straighten it out on behalf of the book table. This is a little book I finished after my wife's death called Is There Any Hope? It's already a bestseller. It's only been out two months. Everything we printed on this are gone. What we have left is on the table. And as long as these last, you buy something else, we give this to you free. Is there any hope? Now I also want to mention, people ask me about the book on Revelation. Yes, you're right. I wrote one 25 years ago called The Coming World Leader. It had 280 pages. This one has 576 pages. And uh, Dr. Ed Heinsohn told me, he said, I wish I'd have written that book. He said, that's got to be one of the greatest ever written on the book of Revelation. I said, thank you. Now, when are you going to buy your copy? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, several of you have asked me about the Jewish calendar. We put it out every year. It's 16 months. Uh, it's only $10, but you don't have to pay that. You can go to Israel and buy it for $38. <laughs> That's the truth. And I'm the one that designed it. In the back, there's a complete analysis of all the Jewish festivals and how they relate to the Messiah. There are pictures that you can cut out and frame of only Scripture. And uh, we have done this for many, many years. They are there, and uh, you want to... Does your wife have this? No, she doesn't. Well, you need to start ordering more from us. <laughs> Good. Thank you. I need to. Real quick, the book Babylon, History and Prophecies is also a bestseller. It became a bestseller in less than a year. It's a story of Babylon. Uh, it was a doctoral dissertation of mine many years ago. And I never did anything about it. But last year, some guys that I disciple took a look at the notes and said, you got to put this out. Babylon. There are things here you haven't read anywhere else. And I have a lot of books on it. In the back of this book is a list of all the actual Babylonian 
practices of the Roman Catholic Church. All of them, two pages of them. And you will be stunned. We have had Catholics buying this like crazy because they're in shock. They don't understand why their church does what they do. Babylon, it's out there. Take a look at it. This is brand new. You're the first people to see it. I asked several pastors, what books of the Bible do you, uh, you haven't really taught? Every one of them said the same thing. The 12 Minor Prophets. I put out a book called The 12 Minor Prophets. Prophecies about Israel and the coming day of the Lord. It's brand new. You're the first ones to see it. I also have revised what was the best-selling leadership book uh, among all printers for many, many years. And I did an update. It's called Seven Laws of Christian Leadership. It is out there. One of the pastors got one, read it. He said, that's the greatest thing I've ever read on spiritual leadership. I used it to disciple guys who are going into the ministry, but also men who are finding it hard to live for the Lord in such a crummy society as we have. Take a look at it. Now, what has been said by Thomas Ice and by Dr. Uh, Nicholas about Israel? I bring before you another best-selling book called Israel Chosen by God. It's not just in English. We had a couple from Canada who actually sent me the money to print it in Hebrew and distribute it in Israel. This has gone to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, his entire cabinet, whom I have met. And then it went to the entire parliament called the Knesset. And now it's being distributed. We're almost done with the entire Israeli defense forces. The Orthodox rabbis have voted it for the book of the year. This is English. We do have it in Hebrew, if you would rather have it in Hebrew. <laughs> so that's that. And... Um, it's time to get into the Word of God. My assignment from Dr. Nicholas was hope in the end times. How thankful I am for that title. We all need hope. The world is hopeless right now. There's a lot of anger in North America. And I've run into it. By the way, my views on Israel caused the opposition to say that I was the most dangerous man in Israel because in America because of my views about Israel. I wrote him a note, Senator Darcy, Sproles and others, and I just said, I want to thank you for your criticism. Ever since you have criticized me, the sales are going off the charts. <laughs> it's wonderful. So anyway. This particular subject is very dear to my heart, as you can well imagine. I watched uh, almost the entire year, 2015. I watched my wife suffer tremendously. She fell on a rainy day, slipped and fell down on the cement. Uh, she had a detached retina from that. Her knee. They said they had never seen such a disastrous knee. It was broken into 25 fragments. And in addition to that, much to the surprise of the medical profession, she broke her femur bone, your largest bone in your body in your thigh. They have worked hard to try to help. Everything just kept getting worse. But I became very... Uh, acquainted with the doctors of infectious diseases at St. Joe Hospital in Orange and also the nurses. The last 17 days of my wife's life, she was comatose. I was with her all the time. When we weren't at the hospital, I took her home and I took care of her. That in itself is a lesson in brokenness and humility and the need of God's power and strength. 
The fact is, I rejoice that the suffering is over. I saw her. A woman who hardly ever said anything, very sweet, kind, but she was screaming most of the time. All the pills and pain medications just didn't seem to help. The last day she was conscious, 13 nurses came into our ICU room and wanted to pray with me about my wife. I've never heard anything like that before in my life. After they finished that morning in prayer, and it was a beautiful time, four of the doctors came in in the afternoon and wanted to do the same, apologizing to me because they couldn't help her. And uh, we had a wonderful time of prayer. You can only imagine what it was like to watch her shrivel up. She was a beautiful woman and uh, to see what happened at the end was indeed difficult to take. So I thank you, Dr. Nicholas, for choosing this subject for me. It will take much more time than the remaining 30 minutes, but I will do my best. Hope and a new body. How many of you looked into the mirror this morning? <laughs> and are now convinced you need one. Amen? 1 <laughs> Corinthians 15, please. 1 Corinthians 15 will begin at verse 35. One man told me last night, as I was preaching out of Grace Baptist, he said, boy, you sure read a lot of scripture. Well, that's the only time I know I'm right. <laughs> I was at a conference in Texas at El Paso, a men's conference over 2,000 men and we had to get out of the Coliseum by 5 o'clock because they had a basketball game that night I was the last speaker and it was now 10 minutes to 5 so when they got me up to preach 10 more minutes I decided just to read the passage and the moderator said, well, because of time, why don't you get into the message? You can skip reading it. I said, no, that's the only time I know I'm right. I'm going to do it. And we had 218 men walk the aisle and want to get right with the Lord. Listen, my friends, we need the Word of God. The issue of all our churches should be the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35. I'm reading out of the old King James. And of course you can recognize I'm an old person. But some man will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened or made alive except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial or heavenly bodies and bodies terrestrial or earthly. But the glory of the celestial is one. The glory of the terrestrial is another, of a different kind, by the way. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory so also is the resurrection of the body, the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in pow power. It is sown a natural body. It has raised a spiritual body. 
there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body and so it is written the first man Adam was made a living soul the last Adam was made a quickening spirit Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Feel free to say amen anywhere. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in an atom in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Amen. <clears throat> For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we pray in these few moments we have together that our hearts will move quickly to the glory of heaven itself. For it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Lord, if there be those listening who are not sure of their own relationship to you, I pray by your powerful Holy Spirit you will convince them of the truth that we're going to have a resurrection body fashioned like unto the glorious body of our blessed Lord Yeshua. Thank you, Lord. May all of us be different because of your word. In the precious name that is above every name, our Lord Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to move through this probably quicker than I normally do. But let me just talk briefly about the facts of your new body. How many of you are convinced that you need one? <laughs> Amen? If you're not, just ask your spouse later on. <laughs> now, first, according to this passage, the relationship to your present body makes you the same person. Can't tell you how many people Ask the question, are we going to know each other in heaven? Well, we're not going to be more stupid then than we are now. <laughs> of course we're going to know each other. Well, how will God do that? And what age will we be? And what will our body look like? Well, here it is. I hope you're ready. In other words, the best of me is yet to come. <laughs> Amen. Its existence requires the death of your present body. I wish I would have known ahead of time all that we had to do just to bury my wife. I wish I would have known all of the financial papers and documents that I had to have. Over 15 different copies of the death certificate. I wish I would have known what those little plates on the ground that has her name on it, what they really cost. 
and it's been remarkable. This last year, I paid $28,500 for my wife in addition to Medicare. And the fact is, since the death and all the mortuary expenses, it's, it's unbelievable. I felt like going and digging the hole myself and just dropping her in there. But we need to understand something in order to know about your new body you're going to have to die amen you see dying is a sweet release into the presence of the Lord when we are absent from the body we are present with the Lord and in his presence there's fullness of joy and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore wow well its excellence, according to the Bible, is going to surpass your present body. Are you looking forward to that, Dr. Nicholas? Yes, sir. Yeah, amen. You just can't do what you used to do. Praise the Lord. And I know how old you are. And I'm just a tad bit older. The essence of that body is connected, however, to your present body. There's where a lot of false teaching and misunderstandings are. But that's what our texts say. And we need to understand that. It is the work of God himself. Amen? God giveth it a body. I'm going to get a brand new body. And the Lord's behind all of that. And it's the will of God. It says, as it hath pleased him. The Lord is really pleased to make me over again. Amen? And the older you get, the more you have the evidence that you need it. I've noticed that without those arms on those chairs, I can't get up. A Chinese doctor friend of mine said to me, David, when your knees are higher than your bottom, you're in trouble. <laughs> so I thank the Lord for that. That's why I'm sitting there. Hey, <laughs> I notice you do too. But the fact of the matter is, it is also the way in which all things reproduce. Listen to these words from God in his word. To every seed its own body. You are unique. God made you. He knew you and knew about you before the foundation of the world. He made the decision to choose you if you're a believer. And that's a middle voice in Greek. He did it in and of himself. There was nothing in you that forced God to do all this for you. Nothing. Sometimes we say, yeah, my son Johnny really plays a good trumpet. I bet God wants to save him. No, he didn't save Johnny because he plays a nice trumpet. No. He did this in and of himself. There was no outside influence. What God's going to do for you and me, he's doing, and it pleases him. We know this text teaches that everything produces after its own kind. Simply stated, that means wheat brings forth wheat, not corn. So you see, in looking at this, the recreation of your body will make you a what? A different person. There's a sense in which it's the same person. But there's a sense in which it is different. What kind of difference? Well, God says all flesh is not the same. We have earthly bodies, you know, living creatures that God has made. 1 Corinthians 15 gives us four categories. I'd love to talk to you. And it's sown in weakness. You do not have the strength or ability to sustain your own body. I have a lady who has a health food store. And she assures me that if I eat her organic something or other, I will live longer. And I said, you know, I'd love to believe you. <laughs> she said, I saw you in the parking lot of Taco Bell. <laughs> I said, you should go over there yourself. They're really good. <laughs> she said, you got to stop eating like that. And then if you 
you do what I say, you'll live to be 70 years old. I said, I'm already 75. <laughs> Look, friends, it's a natural body. Be careful what you say. You like 1 Corinthians 2.14, Campus Crusade popularized the natural man that does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Their foolishness unto him, neither could he know them because they're spiritually discerned. I talked to Bill Bright before his death about it. I said the word natural is not referring to the unbeliever. The whole passage is written to the believer. The whole passage is arguing there's a difference between a carnal believer and a spiritual one. The solical man, that's your personality, what an unbeliever would have also. The solical man does not discern the things of the Spirit of God. So this whole thing is uh, amazing. But the changes we're going to experience, the text says, in corruption, we are going to last forever. Now, some of your friends who are believers that you don't particularly like, this is a tough matter. <laughs> we're going to get to heaven, and you're going to have to enjoy them. Amen? Amen. You say, well, I'll go down Mansion Street to another place. And... <laughs> but the changes are, we're going to have glory. There's going to be great value, great beauty, all coming from the glory of our blessed Lord. There's power, divine power works in us, says Ephesians 3. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ever ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus forever. It will be a spiritual body. That will be a big difference. Yes, we have body, soul, and spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. However, our lives are controlled by our personality, our soul. Usually described as being body, emotions, and will. There's probably a lot more. But when we are receiving a resurrection body, the spirit... Wow, is going to control. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? Now, if you're hard to get along with, you're going to be instantaneously changed. People are actually going to like you. <laughs> It'll be a miracle of the Lord. The contrast, however, between the two atoms... Uh, we could spend a lot of time on this one. The theology of it is tough. I put down three simple things from this passage. One, operation. First Adam was made a what? A living soul. But the last Adam that refers in the text to our Lord, not the last man who ever was created, there were plenty of them, including all of us. The last Adam was what? A quickening, a life-giving spirit. The order is very clear in the Bible. First, it's natural. Then your natural is going to die, and you are going... Well, what if uh, the Lord comes? We're going to be transformed in a moment of time. Amen? On the way up. I call that the group plan. <laughs> We're going to have a great return. And the origin. He said, first is the earth, the second man is the Lord from heaven. I read these passages in detail and tried to talk to my wife about them. She loved to hear the word. And we both got excited about what it's going to be when you go home to be with the Lord. It's going to be amazing, the changes. All we've known is the earthly body. Even though we've had the Holy Spirit in us and the Spirit quickened our spirit and think of the wonderful things fellowship with the Lord has been in your life. Imagine what it will be when the Spirit is going to control you completely. Wow. Something else. The conclusion we draw from these facts. What are they? One. That our future body reveals the source from which it comes. John 4.24, our Lord Yeshua 
3, which is repeated here in 1 Corinthians 15. The Lord God will wipe away all tears from our eyes, our faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. It shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him, and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And all God's people said, Secondly, it's based on divine power. These wonderful promises of the Lord. Verse 57, we spent a lot of time. My wife was totally unable, hardly even to talk. And we read these words, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The word labor, kapiazo, means laboring to the point of being exhausted. And you know sometimes in the work of the Lord we do get tired. But we're going to keep on keeping on because we got a new body coming. And our Lord has all the wonderful plans of the future for us. And in his presence there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And the faithfulness that should result. Verse 58. Thank you, Lord, for putting this verse at the end of this wonderful chapter on resurrection body. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. Every cup of cold water given his name will receive a reward. Hebrews 6.10, God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love that you have shown in ministering to the saints and you still do it. God will never forget it. It might seem to be insignificant and small to your friends and family or church, but it's not to God. He will never forget what you have done. Amen? Will you join me in a closing prayer? Lord, I remember those sweet days of reading these powerful words with my wife who was dying. I thank you, Lord, for your encouragement to keep on keeping on and don't stop. I thank you for Shasta Bible College been so kind to us in our ministry, even in Africa, as one of our teachers received a doctorate here. Thank you for the kindness of Dr. Nicholas, even asking me to come. I know, Lord, that every one of us has certain pains and trials and tribulations, sometimes with our children or our grandchildren or our parents or people that we work with. We don't want them to go to hell. We want them to go to heaven. And I pray, Lord, that as much time as you give each one of us, may we bring folks to our Lord Yeshua, that they may fall at his feet and know that he is the one who died and paid for their sin. And he is the one that was resurrected, thus guaranteeing our own. Lord, thank you for the fact that we have hope beyond the grave. And teach us, Lord, to trust you in your words. For what's coming is sure a lot better than what we got now. We thank you, Lord, in the precious name 
that is above every name, the name of our Lord Yeshua, we pray. Amen. God bless you. You bet.